Welcome everyone to this evening's virtual open house on the Masters of Applied Science in Patient Safety and Healthcare Quality. Um, I'm Kelly Curtis. I'm one of the admissions officers in the department, and I've been working with our online applied science programs uh, for a little over two years. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Albert Wu, the program director, to share a little bit more about his background. Uh, very happy to be here. I am a internist, though I'm mostly an internist these days on Wednesdays. And otherwise, I'm a professor of health policy and management and medicine. And uh, a lot of what I do is do research and try to implement pa patient safety interventions uh, at the Armstrong Institute and Johns Hopkins Medicine. And I also run a research center in the School of Public Health, the Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Uh, this evening's agenda will cover uh, an industry overview um, by Dr. Wu, uh, insights into the curriculum, program details, uh, what online learning looks like uh, with our program, Faculty members will be highlighted. I'll cover more on the admissions requirements, tuition details, and touch on financial aid. And then we uh, will have a time at the end for questions and answers. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, just type those into the chat box and we'll cover those questions at the end of the presentation. Dr. Wu, feel free to, uh, to start. Sure. So um, here's a quote from Peter Pronovost, who until um, just a few months ago was the director of the Armstrong Institute and senior vice president for patient safety and quality here at Johns Hopkins Medicine. And he said, organizations profess patient safety as a top priority but they're still figuring out how to manage it. Um, in particular, how to manage it with the same rigor, discipline, and accountability that they do their budgets. Hospital boards are very interested in patient safety. They're also interested in the bottom line, and they're a little puzzled why we are not able to manage safety as well as we are able to manage our accounts. Um, and it is true that in general, our hospital and most hospitals tend to balance their books at the end of every year, but this is harder to do for patient safety. And I think this is why many of you are interested because there are more and more opportunities out there for work in patient safety. We do know a number of kind of alarming Statistics. These uh, were uh, more or less unchanged for the last 20 years, which is perhaps the, the chronological age of the patient safety movement. Approximately one in 10 patients hospitalized in US hospitals are harmed while receiving care that should be helping them. There are at least um, one and a half million preventable adverse drug events, harm from, uh, from the use of medications in the US every year. Estimates suggest that the cost of those errors, um, tests that otherwise would not be needed, harm from misdiagnoses, and even legal payouts, the toll cost is in excess of $100 billion a year. It appears now that uh, inaccurate diagnoses may be the most common um, and costly medical errors. Certainly sometimes they're catastrophic and they, these are often the things that you read about or hear about in the media. Can we have the next slide? So this is not something that existed when I initially got into this area. But today, uh, more and more frontline clinicians who are not necessarily safety specialists 
And more and more managers who are not necessarily safety managers are in fact committed and even enthusiastic about improving safety and healthcare quality. The problem is, is that they do not have the tools. They don't have expertise. They don't even really have the basic science knowledge and training about safety itself. And then on how to design an intervention, how to analyze and measure whether or not it's working. Um, and it, it makes it difficult for them to lead successfully in safety and quality. The concepts of patient safety and healthcare quality are a real foot in the door. Um, almost anyone can, um, can be convinced that we should reduce patient safety problems in our institutions. And uh, this can appeal from anyone from a, a top level CEO to uh, a frontline provider. So these days there are uh, an increasing number of job titles that people um, that people uh, actually have on their CVs. Director of Quality Management and Patient Safety Officer, Medical Director uh, and Patient Safety Officer, Nurse Director of Clinical Quality. Some of our directors of patient safety, in fact, are nurses, including the Director of Patient Safety for Johns Hopkins Hospital. Uh, Risk and Quality Improvement Director, Director of Vice President of Quality Management, Director of Vice President of Quality Outcomes and Safety, Director of Performance Improvement, Patient Safety Officer, um, or Patient Safety Consultant. So all of these are titles that uh, some of you may already have or may aspire to. So here's the program. This is a full Johns Hopkins master's degree program, but uh, it's a little bit on the cutting edge. This is a practical degree, which is why it's called a master's of applied science. And we have a real skills and tools based orientation. As this is part time and 100% online, we're aiming for people who are mostly people who are working as professionals, often with patients already doing something related to patient safety and quality in their current job or aspiring to do more of those things. The, the course is 48 credits. Um, these are credits that are equivalent to any other degree. Um, Hopkins, instead of having semesters, has quarters. And so there are four terms a year for each of two years. It's actually theoretically possible to stretch things out for as long as four years. Uh, but I would say that most people, not all, most people can uh, figure out a way to fit in two, two courses, perhaps maybe for six credits um, per quarter. There are also professional development and integrative activities. Um, we are, uh, again, I think we're a little bit on the cutting edge of educational methods. We try to do a good bit of group learning. We have actually incorporated some peer assessments into uh, the program itself, because in fact, that's what the, what's done at work anyway. We're very skills oriented. We would like to give you tools and skills and the projects all have a goal of uh, being something that you might very well do um, at work. So uh, it is a little bit of a, we do have a little bit of a public health focus. This is not strictly a medical focus. And in that regard, we want people to understand some of the science of safety and some of these scientific methods. Uh, we don't think that 
safety, running safety in a hospital should be a research endeavor, but we think that research thinking should be part of what operational folks do. And so we want to educate students how to measure safety and quality, how to design systems, um, how to design interventions. Uh, we uh, want people to understand about organizational change and cultural change. Uh, we certainly are very interested in patient-centered care, and we are interested in preventing harm and, when possible, being able to demonstrate that we have reduced harm, that we're making care safer. We can get the next slide, I think. Do you want to say something about um, the curriculum, or shall I say something about it? Um, Dr. Wu, I'll let you share the curriculum. So um, there is a little um, there is a little prerequisite course, which is a sort of an intro to online learning, so that you can avail yourself of the resources that are uh, online. The first, the, uh, again, because this is an accredited public health master's, um, you'll see that there are some courses that are really required for any master's in public health. Um, there is a required, in the first term, there's a required um, academic and research ethics course. That's actually quite small. And there's a seminars in public health course that is also two credits and is more about general public health than it is about safety. But then the first core course for uh, that, that relates to our curriculum per se is an intro to quality of care for practitioners. Uh, that's taught by Sydney D, who is an expert here um, at Johns Hopkins in, in our research center. Second term is a course on the science of safety. Uh, I lead that course. And at the same time, there is a contemporaneous course on case studies on different aspects of quality and safety. Third term, um, there in fact are no safety specific courses per se. There's an intro to, to epi methods, which um, is I think uh, really a foundation for anyone who is working in this business. And there's also a professional development course on writing. Um, and you will have to take my word for it if you're not doing a lot of this now, but in this business, writing papers sometimes, but writing reports, writing memos, um, and editing people's reports, and memos, and documents is something which is a really crucial skill. In the fourth term, there's a introductory statistics course, and then a interesting course on leadership for change, uh, which is taught by uh, some of our top faculty on change management. And this relates to safety and quality. In year two, there's the second Biostat course, um, and a fun course on quality improvement tools that uh, you are likely to encounter and perhaps even use in your work. Second term, there's uh, the other half of EPI and a, a general course on seminars in public health. Third term, uh, it's actually all quality and safety. There's a measurement course on quality and safety. I think this is a crucial set of tools. Um, and there's an, a course that is actually not taught anywhere else in, in the School of Public Health on infection prevention. Uh, that's running right now, and it's, I think it's been a big hit. In the fourth term, a major activity is an integrative activity, which in fact we will have begun thinking about already back in the first quarter of year two. And this is something that's intended to, for, to help you pull together what you have learned. At the same time, there is a measurement lab in quality and safety, which could be very helpful to you in perhaps in um, that integrative activity, but which in general also gives you tools uh, to try out. These are, some of them are related to the measurement and evaluation course third term and allows you to get some hands-on experience with those methods. 
So that's a little bit of a synopsis of the curriculum. Uh, again, it is generally done in two years, but as, if you look at it, you could um, conceivably stretch this out over uh, three years or even possibly four years or some fraction thereof. This is a, we're really actually proud of this course. This is a, um, a very transdisciplinary course. And we began developing it from the beginning um, with faculty from three schools, the School of Public Health, at Johns Hopkins, the School of Medicine, and the School of Nursing. And our instructors uh, come from all of those schools, as well as the business school for that matter. Uh, and also, uh, many of us are affiliated with the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality. The courses are really led by top experts um, whose names you will have heard, who are driving the field through their research and uh, practical applications. Um, and uh, I would say including more than one of uh, the world's leading authorities on patient safety. We've been doing online learning for a long time. I taught uh, the first online patient safety course Perhaps, perhaps the first one at a major um, professional school uh, back in 2006. So we've been going uh, for a while. And the courses uh, are have really quite high production values. We've sort of gotten this down. Um, they are uh, not the usual drone uh, that you encounter sometimes with online uh, continuing nursing education or continuing medical education courses, I think you'll find them quite engaging. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think you might even find them fun. Um, the faculty have recorded all the lecture material, however, and this, I, I think people really do appreciate uh, the ability to consume the material wherever and whenever they want to. There are, um, for every course, um, live uh, online experiences like this one um, to wh where the, there's more direct interaction and uh, it's possible to ask questions. I will say though that for all of the courses uh, there are there's a very active online community basically of students. Uh, by the end of the program Students in a cohort uh, may have been and may have taken courses for two years or even more with uh, just about all of the same people. Uh, people begin to get to know each other quite well. Uh, we see that uh, I see that they uh, sometimes communicate more with one another than they even do with us, and uh, it, it's it's gratifying to see the online discussions. In fact are more robust for the uh, for the online masters than they are for our other um, public health courses that are taught face-to-face um, -face in Baltimore. There is a 24-7 help desk, which is important in case um, IT uh, is, it does, doesn't do what it's supposed to momentarily, or in case uh, you are located in a, in, a place, in a time zone other than Baltimore. Um, it, it really runs very well. Again, we have enough uh, volume of uh, sort of online material that we have the economies of scale that are necessary to, to maintain this. I think I'm really happy with, with the support that uh, we're able to provide. So I'm very proud of our faculty. Um, I've been the director of the course uh, of the program uh, since the beginning. Um, I am joined uh, by uh, Peter Pronovost, or, uh, who used to be co-director, and now he's a, he remains as a faculty member, and Laura Morlock, who is our Senior Associate Dean for Education for the School of Public Health. She's done a lot in risk management. Um, she's a sociologist and over the years has done a lot of research um, in risk management. Um, and. Um, is in, in a way is in charge of all of the courses at the School of Public Health. So she's a good person to have 
um, on our team. I could highlight quite a few others, but um, um, Matt Austin is someone who uh, has been has developed uh, has worked closely with the Leapfrog Group and has developed some of the uh, most widely used training courses. Uh, for the example, for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, Melanie Curlis, along with Lisa Maragakis, um, are infection control specialists. Lisa is the director of infection control. Uh, but I've worked more closely with Melanie, um, both in the US and internationally, in practical applications of infection control. Uh, Renee Demsky, for uh, until very recently, was uh, acting co-director of the Armstrong Institute. Um, Cheryl Dennison Himmelfarb is a nurse researcher um, who is our perhaps strongest link to the School of Public Health. Sydney D is a uh, leading scientist at Johns Hopkins who specializes in quality of care research. Um, let me touch on a couple of others. Jill Marsteller is an organizational sociologist. Uh, it turns out that organizations and systems are terrifically important in um, in patient safety, and uh, I think you get a great understanding from her about these things. Um, Lori Payne is our director of patient safety. Uh, Mike Rosen uh, developed uh, team steps for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Um, Melinda Sawyer is our director of training for the Armstrong Institute, and Kathy Sutcliffe uh, was really the developer of the, the theory around high reliability organizations um, and is uh, internationally known scholar. Uh, there are actually even a few more, but uh, and I haven't said so much about our the folks who teach epi and biostatistics, but I think you'll really enjoy them. Uh, I think that uh, Johns Hopkins is renowned for actually teaching these things in such a way that people feel like they um, understand what's going on, at least while they're listening to the lectures. Uh, next, please. So I'm going to pass it back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ruth, thanks for sharing such great insights into the field of patient safety. Uh, the program and the faculty. And for those that may have joined us after the presentation started, if you do have any questions, please type those in the chat box and we will address those questions at the end of the presentation. So I'll touch on admissions requirements. Um, our applications are processed through a centralized app application portal called SOFIS. Uh, the requirements uh, to apply to this program include a bachelor's degree from an accredited college or university, uh, looking for a minimum of three years of health-related work experience. Uh, a clinical background is not required. A current resume or CV that shows your uh, healthcare accomplishments. Three letters of recommendation. Uh, your statement of purpose should show how your educational and career goals align with the educational objectives of the program. And for any of our uh, interested international students, uh, if you, uh, again, have a degree outside of the U.S., you do need a course-by-course -course evaluation. We do recommend using WEST, or World Education Service. And if English is not your first language, you may need to take a proficiency uh, exam uh, such as the TOEFL. Uh, applicants are reviewed on a monthly basis. Uh, we do encourage students to apply early so if the information that is being provided to you uh, this evening uh, is of interest, do reach out and we um, are here to assist with you, helping you get started. Uh, the um, absolute final deadline to uh, submit your application is uh, July 1st. With our one start a year, which is September 3rd, that's a Tuesday. Um, I'll touch on uh, tuition, our partial scholarship, and financial aid. So the uh, cost per credit hour currently 
is 1,128 per credit hour. We do have an OPAL scholarship that is unique to the Masters of Applied Science program. Uh, that's $433 per credit hour. So the cost to the student is $695. And as a reminder, there are 48 credits uh, in this program. There's no separate application steps required to receive that scholarship. Uh, by uh, completing the application steps, that does serve as the uh, application for the scholarship. So again, it is awarded to all those who do get accepted into the program. Uh, it, behind, beyond the scholarships, if you are interested in exploring uh, financial aid, either FAFSA or private loans, the contact information for financial aid office is on this slide. I can share with you that our school code for FAFSA is E is an excellent 00234, and that's E00234. Uh, in any changes uh, to the tuition scholarship for um, our upcoming fall start, I uh, will be on our website uh, in the next few months, so please take um, a note of that. And I think now we can turn it over to uh, questions. While you're so thinking like of questions, have... oh, go ahead. While you're thinking of questions, I'll say that we have already uh, been reviewing applications for a couple of months, and we've already accepted some students and who have accepted us. So, uh, if you are interested, uh, now would be a great time to begin to prepare your application. So it looks like um, we have a question. It looks like we have a question on uh, the experience that you're looking for. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about what the admission committee is looking for? You know, what we are looking for is someone who is doing work or contemplating work that would really benefit from getting the kind of training that we are providing. So we have quite a diverse uh, student body, I will say. It is true that some people have, um, you know, sort of medical or nursing or clinical training. We have doctors and nurses and pharmacists. Interestingly, we also have dentists and, uh, and we have at least one veterinarian. And uh, we did not think that this disqualified <laughs> the applicants in any way. They, if you are able to make a case, for why this uh, will be useful to you, um, and you can convince us, uh, that that's pretty much good enough. There are also people who do not have a clinical background at all, but who initially, but who have begun to work one way or another in uh, quality management, uh, patient safety, and related areas. So we have people who are, in fact, in media relations. We have people who are in engineering and quality control. We have people who are in much more professional roles. Uh, we have someone who was originally a phlebotomist, um, but who has begun began to do patient safety and realized that this was something that they were meant to do. And in fact, um, uh, that person has already risen pretty high in their organization. So um, we are we're trying to fill a niche. We're trying to fill. Uh, we're trying to meet a need for professionals who are working in or would like to work in patient safety and feel like they would benefit from the training. We do have a few people who um, I might have thought would have aimed for a master's in public health or something similar. We have a few. Um, medical and nursing graduate students, uh, for example. Uh, we have a few uh, residents and interns and residents, and we certainly have a few people who are actually faculty of nursing or medicine or pharmacy, uh, 
Um, those are not the majority, but um, uh, I could, we can certainly see how they uh, could use the material. And uh, we didn't discriminate against them just because they have, for example, a medical or surgical background. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Uh, a student is asking, and I think I can answer this question, how many students do we plan on accepting to the program? You're not competing against the seat. They are looking for quality applicants. Uh, so there's not a cap on that uh, uh, for, uh, for students. There's yeah, another I think it question. Be a, I think it oh, would be a terrible thing. I was gonna say, I think it wouldn't be a terrible thing to apply a little bit earlier. You know, it like like for everything, um, there are many people who apply, you know, sort of 24 in the 24 hours before the deadline closes. And because there is a crush of applications, I think that any reviewer might tend to be just a little bit more skeptical, you know, for the last you know, 50 applications that came in on, you know, a, a, a minute before midnight. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're truly interested, you know, I would encourage you to go ahead and put in the application. Yeah, thank you for um, uh, reminding students to apply early. There's not a lot of time to uh, review files uh, between July 1st and when we start September 3rd. So we do encourage you to, to apply early. There's a lot of things that we do to provide service to our students to get off to a great start. Uh, the next question is, and Dr. Wu, I'll let you handle this. Is there a master's thesis uh, in the program curriculum? There is no thesis. However, everyone um, does um, uh, sort of create a paper for the integrated the integrative experience. Um, it, I wouldn't call this a dissertation by any means, however. It's not a piece of research. Um, it is uh, more of a practical product that pulls in the different skills that are, you know, that are uh, conveyed during the two-year course. I have another question for you, Dr. Wu. Uh, the question is, is, is this program based on the American model system or is it more globally based? So it is, you know, I think that there's a little bit of a focus on the American system uh, almost inadvertently. Just about all of the um, research on patient safety has been done in in English speaking countries, and that's you know I'm and I'm now inadvertently you know not giving enough credit to the French and German and uh, Japanese researchers that are doing work in this area. But uh, but we don't really teach so much about health systems. Um, and in fact, in, uh, in our case studies, uh, our case study course, in fact, is run by um, a woman who, a, a physician who's trained in India. And uh, some of the cases are, in fact, international cases. We do have, so we certainly have international students, and we welcome that. Um, a lot of my own work has been um, outside of the U.S. and we have lots of cases uh, from low and middle income countries as well as uh, some from other European countries. So I have another question that I will uh, turn over to you. Uh, I have a student that is asking uh, the demand uh, for uh, patient safety and how does somebody go about that is interested in patient safety to find a job? So that's a good question. I mean, I think that these days, uh, if you go, uh, I'm not an expert in applying for jobs, you know, the, the, the general job market, but every public health department um, in, a, in city uh, or state um, every large hospital and health system 
have positions that have patient safety in the name. So, um, you know, I would, I would look there. There are also research firms and contract research organizations and professional societies and um, uh, regulators uh, that, that also have uh, positions in these areas. There's no shortage of these positions. So um, it's, not a, it's not a great answer, but um, it, it, there, there really are a lot of these positions out there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wu. I have another student asking uh, about how much time should they expect to devote the program on a weekly basis? Yes, yeah, so what we, what we um, feel like is that um, the, it, there is uh, Credits uh, sort of translate in a way to contact hours. So it, it would seem like, you know, that there might, if there was an hour of lecture, there might be a couple of contact hours. There might be a couple of hours worth of work that related to that one contact hour. So I, I think that people might, on average, say, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> might spend eight hours, 10 hours a week um, on coursework. I think that varies a lot though. Some people are pretty efficient and might spend five or six and some might spend more. So is that per class, um, that time commitment of, of five to 10? No, I think that's probably per quarter. Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit more than that. So we have a student that's tied a little bit into the healthcare experience. They want to know what that means by healthcare accomplishments on the resume or CV, especially if you come from a diverse background. Well, diverse or not, I think that experience could be personal experience um, with, uh, with a health problem, with a patient safety incident. Um, I think that you know, I wouldn't, those things certainly are experiences and very important, but, um, you know, but are not, uh, I wouldn't call those accomplishments per se. Um, I think that having worked in, uh, you know, anywhere in uh, a, a field that either includes quality assessment, quality management, or actually patient safety, uh, would qualify as experience. Uh, I don't know, what, I'm not sure exactly what we mean by accomplishments. Um, I suppose um, completing a project, um, writing a paper, um, organizing an event, uh, 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 giving a presentation, all of those things would qualify as accomplishments. I have a student that um, wants to know if a GRE is required, and I can answer that. It's a pretty simple question. A GRE or GMAT is not required. Um, the admissions committee will look at all the documents um, in your file. You know, if you've taken a GRE or a GMAT, you know, send it in. <laughs> but it'll it'll help us. But it's not required. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I have a, a couple questions as far as how many students are usually in a cohort. So there have been two cohorts. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the first cohort had 48 students in it. Um, and the second cohort had 99 students in it. So um, we're not sure how many people will be in the next cohort. I think about of that that 48, I, it seems like 30 some are slated to graduate on time, and other people, uh, for a variety of good reasons, have just had decided to spend a little bit more time. So maybe, you know, maybe 15% of the class has decided to uh, spend more than four semesters or 
two years taking the coursework. Thank you, Dr. Wu. So uh, another question, there's kind of, a, uh, there's a couple questions that touch on this. One is, uh, is there uh, any requirement to come to campus? And the other question is, if someone wanted to walk for graduation, can they? So there is no requirement to come to campus, but you can, but you can absolutely walk at graduation if you would like to. Dr. Wood, can you talk a little bit about the uh, networking opportunities uh, with the online classroom, either with fellow classmates or professors in the department? Yeah, so um, there are, I think there's a lot of networking opportunities. Um, as, as a student, you know, sort of all students in a way um, go to the head of the line a little bit in terms of uh, sort of uh, being, getting your, your messages to faculty and other students for that matter answered promptly. There's a little bit of an ethic around here to if anyone sends you a message from anywhere that you should respond, but you know, that, that doesn't always scale perfectly. Um, and but students, current students have a little bit of a special status. And if a student asks you for a question or, he uh, wants to talk or even meet um, faculty, you know, go to great lengths to try to do that. Um, and there is the, uh, there's really a very active online community, which in fact, in, um, I, it seems to me, um, also has spread out a little bit so that it's not only on our official channels, but um, there is a discussion board that is always running um for the for a cohort year and then there is uh for every class there are discussion boards that we encourage students to use uh and we encourage them to talk about anything on the discussion boards that is in any way vaguely relevant to uh you know to the course material and we have some quite uh elaborate and engaging discussions going on at any given time, you know, sort of several of them. Even on the online chats where I, where, which I get to see, you know, many of them, um, even though we're discussing material, there are often two or three sort of side conversations going on um, online simultaneously. It's a little hard to follow all of the threads, but it's obvious that people, um, you know, are, used to interacting with each other and in fact uh, have gotten to know each other pretty well. So I have a student that wants to know about the um, application fee. Um, I can handle that question. Uh, when you get into SOFIS to start your application steps, there's no fee required. When you're ready to submit, um, the application fee is $135. Uh, I have a student that wants to, to know a little bit more about the integrative activity. The last, the one, the, one of the two last classes in the term. Yeah, so the, so the la one of the last classes in the term, it takes up four credits um, of, of uh, time. And it, at the beginning of this, this is, I will say this is evolving a little bit, but what we've done thus far is in the beginning of year two, um, you're invited to begin to think about um, a, a topic that you're interested in pursuing. If you don't have any particular interests, uh, there are a number of topics that are, you know, provided as, you know, as uh, op options that you could pursue. And the idea is to develop a, uh, really a paper, I suppose, um, which uh, encourages you to uh, look up, read about, to some extent research what's known about that topic, uh, why, what, what are the causes, what are the factors that contribute 
to it uh, being able to, to, if it's an adverse event, to being able to occur? What is the evidence about different kinds of interventions that can be used to try to combat the problem? What are measurement strategies that uh, could be used to track um, the success of interventions? If you were going to evaluate such an intervention, how would you go about implementing that? Um, what metrics might you use to show that uh, you are succeeding? Um, and and what, how would you know that that things that things were now safer or better? Uh, so that's that is pretty much what we have currently. Uh, and this is a problem related to safety or quality. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, a student wanted to know what kind of platform that we use. I think I can address that question. Uh, because of our extensive experience with um, online education, we have created our own platform. It's called Course Plus. And the introduction to online learning course that Dr. Wu mentioned earlier is uh, a, a pre-course that everyone takes before they start the, the program so that you're comfortable um, with the platform that we've created, you're comfortable with how to uh, drop your assignments and interact uh, in that classroom platform. Dr. Wu, is there anything else that you would like to add? I don't think so. You know, we've been using Course Plus for, uh, for you know, for, you know, more than a decade now. Um, and it's gone from being pretty good to being um, even a little better than that. Well, thank you, Dr. Wu. Thank you for providing such great uh, information about the program. I really appreciate you sharing um, all your wealth of information. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. You will be sent a recording uh, to your email, and the recording will be available on the, the website as, as soon as it's available. If you have any questions, uh, please do reach out uh, to myself. My contact information is on this last slide. Uh, we do have a dedicated admissions team who's looking forward to working with you. Uh, everyone have a great night, and we do look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I hope we see some of your applications uh, at, at very least uh, online. Take care.